Hello everyone, thank you very much for, for clicking on this video link. Uh, my name is James Casey and I'm going to present a short synopsis of a larger talk that I did um, when I was asked by Fiona Weldon, um, our Strategies for Change coordinator, uh, to talk about disability, power representation and culture. And it's a brief history of disability imagery in Western European societies. That's quite a mouthful. And we're probably thinking, what has art history got to do with disability? Or what is imagery got to do with disability? Well, it's quite a lot. Because we have to know where we come from to understand where we're going or what was going before us. So just a couple of caveats within this, this little uh, video we're going to do today. Um, this is about Western European society. It's not because it is somehow primary among other societies or histories or um, civilizations. It's not. There is vast and diverse and nuanced, huge amounts of, of different art histories and legacies and civilizations throughout the world. But this is all, this is the one that I know about today. And it's the one that is localized to us, but it's certainly not the only one. I mean, if we were to look at other continents and go back in their art history, the continent of Africa alone has multitudes of civilizations, histories, um, cultures, city states, wars, rebellions, foundations, inventions. But that's a talk for a grin, and it's, it's it would be a beautiful talk indeed. But today, we're going to have a little quick look at all these images that we see throughout history and see how are they related to disability. Well, they are, and they aren't. But we have to think about what is art and what does art mean and what does imagery mean when we talk about disability. So one of the more first interesting images that I always find when I'm talking about disability or, or, or thinking about impairment or power especially, and I've broken it down into six different categories with, with these images, I'm gonna start with the first one. And this is just for the purpose of this talk. This is not necessarily an art history lecture that is, is grounded in, in some massive research background. This is just how we have divided it up within six bite-sized periods that I believe are interesting to look at in isolation. And they're quite big. We're going through 40 to 50,000 years of history here. Um, and some of the gaps are quite large and the jumps are quite large. But for the purpose of this, I, I, I've broken them to six. And these are prehistoric, the classical period, the medieval, the enlightenment, the industrial revolution, and the contemporary. And they're quite big, but you know, we're gonna get through them and we'll see how we go. So starting with the very first one is the prehistoric period. So this is, these are two images, which for me, I think are ridiculously beautiful. Just a little bit of context about these two images. These images are found in a cave called the Chouveau Point to Arc Cave in France. My French is horrendous. They were discovered in 1994, it's in the south of France. Um, these images are part of a larger series of images within this huge massive cave that goes back for maybe half a kilometer. These images we see now are obviously, you know, animals. We see the first image at the top, we have, and I think it's done with charcoal, most likely it probably is, um, a series of animals, the rhinoceros, they look almost impressionistic rhinoceros. Below that is another image where we see lions. These were our ancestors. These are our shared history. This is at the very, very, very end of the last ice age coming into the new, new um, civilizations coming. Civilizations or more tribes coming from the south of Europe, repopulating Europe after the ice age. There was people still here, but there, there wasn't that many. So these arts or the history of art, this is one of the best examples of Neolithic, or sorry, prehistoric art, which would go from the Paleolithic all the way up to the Neolithic. And what's interesting in this cave, which it has been dated to 40 to 45,000 years old. I mean, think of that, that's, that's, it's even incomprehensible to think of that. And this cave was active for maybe 5,000 years old, 5,000 years. So from the very first drawings to the very next drawings, there was a gap of, you know, 5,000 years. Within this cave, you, you travel in and you see these fantastic drawings. Look, if you look at these drawings, when we think of art and we think of Stone Age art and we think of our, our ancestors, we think of a very basic art. We think of, you know, stick men fighting a, you know, a mammoth. 
we can see here that whoever drawn these pictures had an idea of composition, of texture, of animation, of structure, especially with the lions. If we see the bottom image, you can see movement here. So you're probably going, what, why, why is this important? Well, besides being you know, a huge important event in our history, and also been a huge space in our history that we all should, should recognize as, as, as a different psyche to ours. What's interesting in this is that our shared ancestors 40,000 years ago, and there are shared ancestors in Europe, um, there is no human forms in this, in this cave. One, there is one, one partially human form in this cave. And it's what's called zoomorphic. And it's only been discovered in 2010 when uh, the film director Werner Herzog, he's a great guy, you should check him out, especially the documentary is made about this cave called The Cave of Forgotten Dreams. He got access to the cave before they, they closed it up for a while because they wanted to seal up the cave and build an exact replica of it. The cave is amazing. When you, when, when you see it inside, and I've seen taken a virtual tour and I've seen photographs. Even the footprints on the ground from 35,000 years ago, children's footprints in the dust is still there. And, and, and to see that, and to see static, but yet this huge weight of history within the space. But previous to him going in there with a very small film crew in 2010, they didn't see any human images. All they saw was a, a series of fantastic images. When you go in there. And, and this is just a tiny part of it. But the scene, he got a camera, Respond to the camera, and there was a let me get this right a static tight hanging from the ceiling, large static tight hanging from the ceiling, almost like a tonsil. At the back of it, they'd seen that what they thought was the bottom of a female form, a very rudimentary female form, um, legs and uh, female genitalia. But when they finally got around to the back to see what was there, this hadn't been done since 1994, they found out that it was the head of a buffalo and a woman. So straight off, that was like, okay, so it's zoomorphic. So this is the beginning of the zoomorphic idea. There's lots of conversation. What is this cave for? Was this cave a source of religion? Was it a spiritual place? Well, it could have been a source of entertainment. It could have been a source of, you know, again, when we think of history, we think of archaeology, everything is, is, is presupposed. Everything is conjecture because that's the way we have to do it. Unless it's written down, we have to have conjecture. We, you know, it's not hard and fast science, it's not maths, it's not black and white, it's all areas of grey and interpretation. To me, and probably to many art historians who I don't know, and I'm not an art historian, my background is in critical and cultural disability studies, these images represent what was important to these people, what was important to the civilization, to the society. And what was important to them was the nature of the scene around them. And there's beautiful stuff there, there's, there's aurochs and there's images of mammoths and images of um, rhinos, lions, tigers, bears, wolves, horses is a huge one too. And they're beautifully drawn and they were drawn over millennia. And this, this society, this, these images was the beginning of our, our culture that we have a, a, a vestige of. But yet the human form didn't come, come into it. They didn't draw pictures of themselves. They didn't have an idea of the self. They didn't have an idea of the difference of the self. Because if you have an idea of the self, then you have an idea of this is what I am because I'm not that. And that's how the other comes into it. So there was no human images in this page, in this cave, besides one, one image, which was zoomorphic. Half female figure, half buffalo. Except that's not to say that there wasn't human traces. There was, there was human traces, they could see bones that were gnawed on, you could see the start of charcoal fires, to use charcoal to paint on the walls. There was, um, you know, little piece, bits and pieces, drip thrown around the place, beads and stuff, because it wasn't habitat as well. Interestingly, there was somebody in that cave who had an impairment. We have, we have actual genuine, 100% bona fide science to say there was somebody in that cave who painted these walls with an impairment. As you enter the cave, there's a series of red handprints made of okra, maybe 50, 60 of them on a wall. And they can see that the person who was doing them was missing a couple of fingers or they were curled in through damage or through impairment, we don't know. And you can see throughout the cave, the same handprints. So there is evidence that there was somebody with the physical impairment at that time. And why wouldn't there be, you know? But interestingly, there was no idea of the perfect human. 
So we'll go on to the next one. Oh, here we go. Here's the horses. I forgot about the horses. Again, we can see this beautiful white horses. You can see the, you know, the way that the texture, these are 40,000 years old. You can see the movement. You can see the, the life. And we have to remember when we entered this cave 40,000 years ago, 35,000 years ago, seeing these almost, and they are almost a mirror image of, of what they've seen. But whoever doing these, these paintings, and it was a series of people over a long period of time, five, 10,000 years, it wasn't just one person. They had such a composer. So there was a, there was a genuine culture of art and drawing and painting and depicting what was important to you as a society, albeit a very small society, but a shared ancestry with us. Okay, here's another example and another way for me to embarrass myself. This is called the Lowen Minch, which is the Lion Man. Um, this is one of our very, 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 very earliest, uh, what we call humanite form, or zoomorphic form again. This is 35 to 40,000 years old. It's carved in ivory and it's from a little valley in Austria. Um, really interesting about this is that you, it's very small actually, it's only maybe five centimeters tall. Again, this is their idea of, I wouldn't say, it's carved of ivory, so it infers that it was something precious. It infers maybe it had a spiritual meaning, maybe it had a meaning of strength or power, we don't know. Um, could be, the doubt it's a female figure because there isn't breasts, so it's probably a male figure. And, and almost you can see genitalia there, but it's not an idealized male figure. It's a male figure that's attached to, again, the lion, this powerful predator in society. It's not a, it's not a figure that says, you know, this is what we have to achieve in our spiritual lives, okay? So you can see that in that. And we can move on a little bit more. Here we have a series, this is a very famous um, statue. Again, very small, made of clay. And this is called the, v the Venus of Willendorf. Willendorf, Willendorf. I, I do apologize to all the German speakers um, that are cheering in here because I'm gonna make a hymn to this. This is from um, 32 to 30,000 BP, which means before Christ. So this is, you know, 30,000 years old. This is an interesting little piece. This would have been one of the first human forms as such that was found. And there's been a series of these found all across Europe, going through south of France, all the way up to the Baltic. Um, as, as the, and, and an interesting thing about the ice repeats. We can see it's a quite grotesque form that we may think, but there's several theories that have come out about this. First one is that, again, it was, it, this is an important piece. This would have been something that would have been kept and used for maybe, well, it dates like to 30,000 years, but it was buried 25,000 years. So this would have been kept knocking around for 5,000 years, possibly as an idol or a totem within a, a, a grouping in society. What we noticed about this though, is that there's an idealized female form, human form, and this isn't it. We're talking about a society you know, 30,000 years ago, our shared society, our shared ancestors, that had a brutal time. I mean, you know, life was, was, was not necessarily digging in the dirt. I mean, these, these people that well, and they had a good life. And, you know, I mean, the, the bone fragments that have found them, they were quite tall and quite slender. Um, but this was an idealized human to them, because there is a series of them all across, all across Europe. What we see here is a small finger of the film, uh, Venus figure, a woman figure, quite voluptuous. Um, you can tell that the, the woman is, 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 is well fed because she's eating. What we see in her face, and this is important, that not necessarily isn't a mask. I think possibly it's braids, and we'll see that in a second, or it could be some sort of covering. There's two theories about this. First theory is that this, this was a fertility cult that went throughout Europe at the time. And um, that could be quite so. Uh, the second theory, which is only a recent theory, in the last couple of months, not even the last couple of months, month, is that these were found as the ice retreated in Europe after the ice, ice age. So the first ones would have been found like 30,000 years ago. The next ones would have been dated to 28,000 years. The next one would have been dated to 25,000 years. So they're going up, up, up as it gets clearer, clearer, clearer. The recent archeological theory is that 
these were almost like a life affirming statue, a totem to say that we have survived this brutal part of our history, the last ice age, that, that the weather is getting better um, and that we've went through this with this totem. This totem embodies, you know, um, plenty of bodies, you know, having fat on your body to survive in these cold climates. Again, there's several theories. Another theory too is that this is a self-portrait, whereas if it's a person looking down at themselves because it's out of proportion, the problem with that is that why didn't they draw their face? They would have been able to see in, in pools, they would have been you know, able to see in ice. So that necessarily doesn't hold so much weight. But the two other theories are interesting. But what is more interesting is that this is our first humanoid statue that have been found. These series of Venuses throughout Europe. But you know, there's no idealized body. Like they're all voluptuous, they're all quite um, out of proportion that we think, that scientists think, that, that, that dietitians think. They're not the idealized perfect body, the normal body. They're different bodies, but they're all very almost um, voluptuous, is probably the word that should be using. But they're very different, but they're very different to what we believe to be perfect, to what we think of in this space, though, this, this time of, of uh, brutality. But to have a look at another one, it's this one here. Now, this is an interesting one. This is called the Venus of Rassenbu. This is our very, 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 very first image of a human, human face that we found. Anyway. Um, you can see here that it's obviously humanoid. It's not zoomorphic. You can see that there's, you know, brow, nose, eyes. They know it's a woman because of the, the size of brow that, you know, men have usually thicker brow here. And there's a call on top of her hair. Interestingly, they didn't know what this call is, but looking back at the previous one, um, they think that this call would have been a covering for the hair. And we have another picture of this here. So we can see here's in the reconstruction. It would almost like a hair covering. But the interesting thing about this, and the interesting thing about the one previous, this is this is made of ivory, by the way. Um, but they have found statues like this made of clay, like the Venus of Willendorf that we just seen. The clay for that traveled over the Alps. Yeah, the clay came from Italy. There is, there is a place in, near in Italy where the clay is from. Uh, so you're talking about quite a brutal journey you know, over the Alps in that time, traveling a few hundred kilometers to Austria and Germany, and indeed this to France, because there has been other pieces found in this when they found this, this, this in the French cave. And this is 30,000 years old. However, to, share, to say that these are very localized societies is not true because this society that didn't take the human form as something that to be idolized, something to be practiced, but yet something that's just accepted. When we think of the Venus of Willendorf, which you've just seen, and the other Venuses, a lot of the clay that came from this, yes, it came from Italy. However, there has been discovered that the clay came, it could have come from Ukraine and part of the East going into Russia. And that's a huge interesting thing because there is also Venus figurines there, a little bit later, but there is Venus ones. That hints to the idea of a shared culture and a shared society rather than fragmented and a shared sense of what's important. Um, so we're not seeing an importance of the perfect human body in these societies. Rather than we're seeing an importance on surviving, an importance on fertility, maybe, but a definitely importance on animals. And what the hell dear was these animals because they were zoomorphic in nature. So we'll click on to the next one. Classical periods. Just before I go on to this and talk about these here, and you're probably going, why is there Egyptian gods? That's not classical. It's not, but there is, there is method to my madness. That statue that we just seen of the Venus of Bassembu, that was one of the, the last ones of what was called the Gravitian culture. And that was our last shared European culture. Um, so from the tip of Spain to the top of Denmark, the culture would have been very similar. After that, after 25,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, society started to develop in isolation with their own religion, their own practices, their own ideas, 
their own languages, but that one was the last. And that is interesting for several reasons, because here's a perfect example. We think of ancient gods, we see these gods. Here we have the Greek gods, we've got Anubis, we've got Cyrus. What's interesting about these gods, again, and this is a huge, I mean, there is other religions, ancient religions, but the Egyptian is one of the most uh, recognizable. Look at the gods. Green skin, you know, head of a dog, head of a cat, you know, this woman's wearing a drum on her head. Again, the idea of the divine, but the divine is not reachable. The divine is not something that the ordinary Joe Salt on the street, the ordinary human that's, you know, dragging a 10 ton block up to the pyramids can understand. Yes, the pharaohs were somehow messengers of the gods and divine, but they weren't gods at the time. These were the gods. These were the images that people were presented of, of the divine. The divine was something outside of ourselves that we can never attain. We could go there, meet them, but we can never attain that. So with the civilizations developing more and developing better and developing stronger, I'm not going to say better, but developing more nuanced, came the idea of, well, you know, what is God? What is perfect? What is man? And here we have a pivotal moment, classical periods further on. So we've got two images here. The first image on the left, which is the one standing straight, that I mentioned, is a Greek kouros, it's called, which is, it means young youth. And this is from Attica in the first century BP. So it would have been, yeah, 1000 BP, 1600 BP. This is the very first example that we found of a human form in perfect proportion and what we see as perfect proportion or what we believe to be perfect proportion. This would have been an, uh, an Attican youth or an Athenian youth who would have died young. These, these, this statue would have been brightly painted. It wouldn't have looked like this. It would have been vivid. It would have been contoured. There would have been pupils and eyes. Its hair would have been textured. But here we see something. Here we see, um, and by the way, there's no pictures of women here. It's all, there is, are no, there's no statues of women at this period, the start of these patriarchal societies. What we're seeing instead is an idealized human form, you know, but we're seeing these across the bar of the board. All these curos, all these statues of young men are all like this. They've all got a six pack, although, you know, it's a little bit out of proportion, but they all look like this. They're all male figures in, in, Symmetr symmetrical figures, but not necessarily in proportion, but they're very, they're very human, very recognized to be human. And there's something that were meant to last, there was something that were meant to be looked up to, and there was something that meant to be near to God. And we zip over to the other God, which is right here. This is a picture of Zeus. This is not a picture of the lead singer of VLO. Zeus, and this is a Roman statue of Zeus, but there's many Greek ones and many Greek examples out there. Zeus is the king of the gods, the great sky god, the great father of Olympus, you know, who rebelled against the Titans and created his own empire. This is the idea of the god, the sky god, the thunder god. This is who rules the clouds. This is who rules our fate. It is a perfect male form. We can see that. Um, we can see the eagle at its foot, that he's alongside the empire. We can see his straw in his hand. We can see that his face is perfect. He's standing in a lovely position. Pex, you know, whole Japan, biceps. This is the start of the idea of godliness, of the divine as being perfect, as being elevated. And that if we can reach this, then we're closer to God. So if we're closer to God by reaching this, then outside of that, you're not closer to God and you're devalued. So that's how it starts in this era, the idea, and this is pertained, by the way, this monotheist idea that God is somehow, if we look at Christianity, our modern Christianity, the idea of the God is always a man, it's a he. Where does that come from? Where, where does the idea that God, if it is, 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 a, is an entity, then it can be anything. It doesn't have to be gendered. Um, and the idea of Jesus, we have a young male, healthy, strong, that's the idea that we attain to. Everything else outside of that is devalued. But then we come to the Middle Ages. Uh, just a, a word about the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages was nuts, okay? 
after the classical period, the Finnish of Rome, and to be fair, the Byzantine Empire kept going. We had the Middle Ages in Western Europe, uh, the Dark Ages in some places. Within the medieval period, they did not think like us at all. Science, well, what was science, mathematics, art, that was lost in some extent. It was kept in Ireland in, in the monasteries, but besides that, the, the rest of Europe went down into a period of, of not necessarily dark ages, but certainly less in the way of, of structure and more in the way of, well, craziness. Um, the way that they even seen the world, the, the people in the Middle Ages would not tell me. They, they, they didn't think in terms of, you know, the Romans and, and the Greeks had a much more deeper understanding of science and, and medicine than they had. Um, and they were much open to, to using herbs. The, the, the Middle Ages are crazy. They would, they would have an idea of humors that, you know, if you have a fever, then you should jump and, you know, put more, put you in the river. Um, if you're feeling sick, it will bleed you. So they, they, they did not see the world as a world of pleasure. They seen the world as, as, as something that needed to be um, endured. And this, again, Christianity has taken hold in Europe at this time. God is not the, the Zeus God as before. God is an angry God. And we are dirty and we are sinful and we are impure. And everything we do is about attaining for our impurity. And that our suffering is what will bring us to the next place. So disabled people were, you know, depicted in, in, in the Middle Ages. Not necessarily disability and impairment was seen as a bad thing. It wasn't seen as a negative thing, as displeasing the gods, as displeasing the divine, but rather as something that we have that will endure us, that we carry this burden, so that in the next life, when we go to the party gates, you know, St. Peter's going to go, yeah, so man, in, you get the, you know, you get the, the, the premier suite, they can all go to the cheaper ones, because in this life we've suffered. So there was images of impairment and disability there. And there was um, stories and, and, and songs of that. Here we see a knight with one leg and he's using a prosthesis. He's got a sword. Uh, actually, I think that's probably a lance and he's got a crutch. These are from um, uh, what they're called uh, morning books where they would have been at their prayers. But it's delicious throughout these. I mean, here's another one. We have a lad in a wheelchair here. It looks like a, it looks like a wheelbarrow, but it's not, it's a wheelchair. So disability would have been part of life then. It wouldn't have been a category. It wouldn't have been a, a signifier. If it was a signifier, it was a signifier of your suffering for a better thing. You know, this life is temporary and that's the way to see this life in the middle ages. Whereas perhaps before the natural world was something to be in awe of, it was something to, to understand to, to not necessarily understand in the, in the prehistoric time. And in the classical period, the natural world was somehow to be controlled. We can, you know, agriculture came along. Um, and, you know, the natural world, if it can be controlled, then that means it's not divine. So we create the divine. And the divine is something perfect, the perfect human body. And therefore, we can be divine. And therefore, we can be male and we can be you know, powerful. But in the Middle Ages, with the fall of that, it kind of went a bit askew. Again, it's power structures. The church hadn't copped on to the idea that disability can be used, impairment can be used. It, wasn't, it was a marker of sin, but at the same time, if we look at it from a little bit more nuanced angle, it was a marker of good things are coming. So disabled people wouldn't, instead of being like shunned as witches and stuff, they would have been in society. They would have done whatever they had to do. And, and, that, and that's quite interesting. But we'll move on. Now, I think everybody knows this picture. Um, this is by da Vinci from the 1490s, Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo, da Vinci, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci. This is called the Vituvrian Man, or I'm not going to try and pronounce it in Italian because I can't. So this is where we see the beginnings of where we did have in the past the idea of the perfect human body. Here we see the Renaissance coming up with, and I think this sums up the Renaissance beautifully, this picture right here. The Renaissance was a period in our history where society, Western European society, re-engaged and rediscovered the classics. They rediscovered 
uh, paintings, they rediscovered art, they rediscovered literature, they rediscovered drama, they rediscovered sciences, they rediscovered the classical empires of Rome, Greece, and Sparta, and you know, the Etruscans. This was a shunning of the, the, the craziness of the, the Middle Ages, and it was a heralding new period in human history, human civilization in Western Europe. And this picture, specifically for us, because we're here to talk about the pyramid of disability, this indicates to us that there was an idea of, well, you know, what are we? Who are we? A little bit of context to this. Da Vinci done this picture, do this, this drawing of between 1490 and 1495. What he did was he went around and he measured, uh, well, Venetian models, shall we say, Venetian male, young male art models. And he used the proportions and he had them together and he got the average man. The word for Turvian, he was, a, he was actually, I think he was a, a Greek uh, architect where they rediscovered his, 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 his scrolls. This has nothing got to do with him. But what it does is that it gives an idea that we, as humans, have to have a mathematical equation to be perfect. That this body that we see in front of us, this average man, this, um, this average man, this human body uh, that gives us proportion, that gives us an idea of something that we need to attain. And we can quite clearly see here with the long hair, put a beard in that guy there and you know we're seeing Jesus, which we have to think about too, because Da Vinci himself was, was, was famous for drawing these ecclesiastic drawings. But when we look at this, we see it's quite clearly human. Uh, it's quite clearly in proportion. He used average male young models to, to draw these. He measured them, quite sure, quite happily. And he, he, he drew this picture. But it gives this idea that our form, our human form, is not necessarily divine. It's not necessarily a source of God. It's not necessarily from the, the, the heavens. But rather, there is an ideal form. And this is what it is. And everything else should be measured against that. Okay? And this is where maths comes into it. The Enlightenment, jumping along another couple of hundred years. So here's another picture I want to show. I think it's interesting because this is a, a nativity scene. This is done by Gerard David, who was a Flemish, no, he was a Dutch Neanderthal, Neanderthal Netherlander painter from 14, 1498. And Gerard Davis was, was uh, Gerard Davis, excuse me, Gerard Davis. Gerard Davis was known for these ecclesiastic scenes and his use of color. What we're seeing in this period too, and even in the Renaissance as well, except with the with the, the portraits of, of noble people, majority of pictures were still religiously inspired. And here we see this picture, right? In the end of the Renaissance, coming into, you know, well, maybe the height of the Renaissance towards the end, the focus is very much on the divine. It's on, it's on, we can see here, this is obviously um, Mary, there's a few angels and stuff there. There's a baby, which we assume to be Jesus, but the whole central focus of this picture, what draws our eyes in is the radiance coming from her and her gazing on him. But it's divine, it's ecclesiastic. We're learning from this. This is something we see in the Bible. But again, it is religious, it's otherworldly, it's divine. Think about this picture. And now think about this picture. This is a very famous picture by Joseph Wright of Derby from six, 1768. Before this, and while you're looking at this, you have to listen to me about this little point. What was the Enlightenment? When the Enlightenment started in the late 1700s, and it was a period in the history of Europe where science began to take control, that we believed that we could control, we could reason everything. There was huge advances in philosophy, mathematics, warfare, um, medicine, literature. Some of our gracious literature comes from that time, the romantic poets, the works of Descartes, the works of um, Immanuel Kant, who I'll come back to in a minute, the works of Joseph Locke, you know. The, the, this was a huge period. It was the, the beginning of democracy again. But within the Enlightenment, remember, 
within the Enlightenment, man decided he should have power over nature. And if we look at this picture, at the very central focus, this, this is a beautiful picture. I mean, this is you know, 1768. But if we look at the central focus, we see a guy there who looks like a cross between Peter Stringfellow and um, Horticoats, who was, was RT children's show presenter back in the 80s, film age. But what we're seeing here is that he is doing an experiment. What, what this is called is this is an experiment in the boat. This is called an experiment with the bird in an air pump from 1768 by Joseph Wright of Derby. The philosopher, or what he's called, he was called a natural philosopher, the scientist guy with the red jacket, he is conducting an experiment. Our focus is drawn into him. The light is reflecting off his face. Everyone's gazing not at him, but at his power over nature, at understanding nature. He's obviously put the bird into a vacuum, sucked out the air, and the bird has died. He's illustrated that he has power over nature. So now the focus is shifted. No more is our destiny, is our reason defined by religious, defined by the gods, defined by nature. We have power over this. We can change things. So the old ways of trying to understand things by spiritualism, they're gone. No, it's science now, it's reason. And a lot of the time, everything, what if was, everything could be made sense of. And you can see that too in, in, in the Enlightenment, because it's the beginning of modern psychology, the beginning of modern sociology, economics, um, certainly the beginning of the novel, the English language novel. And with this picture, it illustrates that. I think it's, it, it's, it's a very useful thing to look at and, and, and to compare to the previous picture, which we've seen of the focus constantly on the divine. And also within this picture, you can see too, there's, there's quite a lot going on. And it's a beautiful picture. For instance, in the two young people over here on the left-hand side, they're looking gazing in each other's eyes. You can see the young woman turning away from this. There's a whole lot going on here. And I think that that's quite useful, but it is a whole elements different society. This is the thing with the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment thought that they could uh, understand everything, that they could reason for everything, that for every cause, there's an effect, that for every effect, there's a cause, that nature was something that we could understand. I mean, even in the Enlightenment, you think of things like um, electricity with. Your man, England, and your man, England. But it was really about bringing an advance in society. It was about bringing us up from, from submissive to dominant. And it was about creating order. But you know what? Sometimes order didn't be created. Sometimes you couldn't use science to, or the beginnings of science, our philosophy to understand something. And here we see in, in, in Western societies and cultures, here we see the power, the power struggles and the power um, dynamics when it comes to disabled bodies. Because disabled bodies and disabled minds or you know, impaired minds, they stood out from this. They could not be reasoned. And the Enlightenment brought this idea of reformation as well, that they could reform prisoners, they could reform jails, they could reform you know, the, the broken things. They could, they could master them, they could make them better or what they seem is better. But with impairment and disability, that didn't happen. And, and it, we see the start of the idea of disability as the monster, or depicting the monster. And I, I'm going to go on to one of the few depictions of disabled people that we have from the Enlightenment. And this is by Francisco Goya. This is 1795, towards the, the, the peak of the Enlightenment. And this is called Scene from the Madhouse Yard. And it's quite, it's quite a harrowing scene to look at. We see, you know, a series of figures drawn starkly with drawn faces and many of them naked within, within this, this darkened space and the sun flowing in the top but not reaching the bottom. And we see one of them grasping its, its arms and hugging itself, a person obviously looking very distressed. We see two figures wrestling with no clothes on and we can obviously see it must be like a guard or a warder about to whip them. And we see another one crawling on the ground. Uh, uh, Goya, the, the, the Spanish painter and, and printer, he, 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 he done all types of humanity. He, he wasn't afraid to do this. He done what was, the, what was called the black paintings, which are 
which are uh, quite quite shocking in some way, and they can be quite disturbing. But they weren't afraid to show that humanity wasn't as ideal as we think. Um, he had some he had some serious uh, impairments himself, and he he dealt with a lot of emotional distress throughout his life. And 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 by drawing these pictures, and he drew some other ones too. He was illustrating that well. This is this is a way that if, if the enlightenment is all about making things better, then why why are we treating people like this that fall outside the, the enlightenment, that fall outside the idea of reason, that can't be reformed within our very narrow parameters of reformation of understanding. Um, and you presuppose this, and you you compare this with the idea of let's 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 pick another Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein's monster, about science creating this grotesque, physically impaired, slow-talking character that's just full of vengeance and evil. That science messed with the natural order when it came to this, and science is going to get paid back by this, so that there were limits to our scientific knowledge, the enlightenment. However, there was also stuff that we could never control, or the elite could never control within the enlightenment, and impairment and disability was that. So we were a predicament. We were something that stood out. Um, a, a, a little footnote on the, on the idea of Shakespeare, that he somehow has been the root and cause for the whole idea of negative imagery with disability by using Richard III. Well, look, there's two reasons I believe in this, that, that this is not necessarily true. The first reason, well, Richard III isn't really about disability. Richard III is a piece of Tudor propaganda. It's about the Tudors saying, yeah, well, look at the House of Lancaster. They were total horrendous you know they were they were just evil through and through uh, everything they did was bad and that was done it was like the, the previous regime were bad were great you know second thing was and this is quite important a lot of the scholarship and all the ideas up to the point was like well Richard III wasn't disabled at all there was no evidence from him to be he was disabled you know what Shakespeare did was he associated impairment and disfigurement and and physical difference with evil. Well, you know, I should sure, like actually, Richard III was disabled. Richard III had an impairment, a serious one, but Richard III, he, he rose the power of king. He was, he was quite powerful leader and wasn't necessarily a bad king. He did kill his nephews, but it's part and parcel of it. And what Shakespeare was doing and what he always did throughout his, his, his career was he never wrote anything new. He just got stuff that was existing and made it better, made it more popular. So, and he preyed upon it. So if we think of Shakespeare now, we, we shouldn't think of him as some high class poet at the time. We should think of Shakespeare of like, you know, the uh, Jerry Bruckheimer of the time. He's the, he's the big explosion, fast and furious plays of the, the, the 16th century. He isn't the, um, he isn't the Lars von Trier, no. He's, he, he, he's like big explosions. He's the Michael Bay. He's the transformer guy. So we shouldn't take him and blame him for the whole negativity of visual imagery. And there's a tendency to go rich third, rich third. It's like, well, come on, two things. You're also letting off the millions of images that existed before that and the centuries of and the millennia of change and of art and of history and the understanding that's quite subtle and that not necessarily disability was associated with negativity. It wasn't. It didn't even come into the minds of people. It was associated with other things that not necessarily weren't so bad and that we can understand that. And if we can understand that, then that means that what we are now, which we'll come on to in a while, isn't always the way it should be, but that disability is always used for something else or it's not used at all. It doesn't matter because it's just regular. It's part of humanity. It's part of the norm. So I think by, by using Shakespeare and putting all the, 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 the eggs in his basket, I don't think that's quite fair. But going back to the Enlightenment, not necessarily all of it understood the idea that disability was something that couldn't be cured, that couldn't be defined. Sometimes the great minds of that era just thought that disability was, was human, that impairment is human. There's, I, I, always, I always go back to, to, to this saying, and I think it's a very lovely saying. It's by the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Um, Immanuel Kant was from... Uh, Kaliningrad, it's called Kaliningrad now, Kaliningrad in Prussia. Um, he, he, for me, and for many, is, 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 is the mind and the writings of the Age of Reason, or the, the Enlightenment. And he, he is a very beautiful saying. He says that 
um, from the crooked timbers of humanity, no straight thing can ever be made. And I think that's very lovely that, he, that he's admitting that well, we're, we're, there is no perfect biology, there is no perfect mind. We are all in some ways flawed, and that's what makes us what makes us beautiful. So, anyway, the Enlightenment heard this age of reason, but it wasn't to last. We go on to our next period, which are our second final period. And this is the Industrial Revolution. This is again, these things are important to us because we've got lots of history of this, we've got lots of records. The Industrial Revolution started just after the Enlightenment, and this was a period where instead of it being an agrarian society, smaller little groups out in the country, we became societies that could produce, that could make stuff and, and lots and lots and lots of stuff. And by doing that and by making this stuff, we had a value to the stuff. We could make wheels, cogs, widgets. We could, you know, control nature on a mass industrial scale. But again, there's a lot that falls into this. It's the idea of the steam engine, the idea of a water mill. We went from very small scale to very large scale. We went from small populations to massive populations of cities. But, and this is the thing, instead of having the dray horse pulling the plow, well, now you need a steam engine. Well, you needed people to work in those factories. So now people had another value rather than slaves or farmers or artisans or craftspeople or poets, people were capital. Up until this point, the only idea we had of, of the, the ideal human well, it's not necessarily a perfect physical human body. Yes, that existed, but it wasn't pervasive in societies in Western Europe. The church had a part in that, but the church was doing other things, getting its power together and messing or whatever it does, hijinks. With the start of the Industrial Revolution, we needed to know how much money can the average person make for us? So that became the idea of, well, what can the average man carry? What can the average man lift? What can the average man uh, pull. So a French guy called Quebec decided to have a look at statistics, and he used statistics by using different experiments and collecting them and collating them together. And he came up with the, the theory that the average person, the average say Frenchman at the time, was five foot six with 12 stone, a 10 stone, um, had two eyes, could see perfectly that we think of. He had five digits in each finger. His arms and legs move perfectly. He can lift 13 bales of cotton in an hour onto this loom. And that in itself created an idea. Well, if people are capsule, then, you know, what are these other people that don't fit in within that? What are these people that are worthless in our new industrial society? The society of gain, the society of money, the society of advantage. So other people fell outside that. And disability again became something that it's, it's gone. Well, how do we do with this? What are we going to do with them? And there was initiatives. Here's one of them we see in front of us in this image. This is called a blind school factory. It's from 1850 and it's Manchester. And we see people who are visually impaired, men predominantly sitting on the floor making crafts. But not on the scale of other factories, the massive factories in, in England and in Ireland too. Um, and across the states and across the Western world. Not on that scale. Rather, these are places that disabled people were narrowed into a little, a little hole, a little, a little place. And it stopped becoming part of normality, part of our, our family unit. Um, if disabled people were living in the country, they would have been doing whatever they had to do. We were just part of that society, you know? Now it was urban, it was money, it was cost, it was capital, it was economics. And the disabled people were not part of this because their ability was matched to their worth. And that's very important. Because then we see the eye, the size, then we see the beginning of the uh, freak show. And these are horrible things. But this is what happened. Uh, during the, the Victorian time, the idea of the grotesque, the idea of the familiar, the idea of the freak came to the forefront. You can see here the hall of ugliness. And these were things that really happened. By far the ugliest biped is here, one shilling. You can see the first one. The second hall says, hall of ugliness, the greatest deformity in the world. The third one says, this is, this is the knee plus ultra of hideous, you know, and science pointing down. 
beast boy or skater boy. So here, this ability with the excess of people's wages that the average human, the average person, they wanted something to go out and say, well, we're all similar, then we have to be, you know, somewhere well elevated. And they went and they looked at these, these, these deformed humans, us, me, you, you know, uh, with drooping eyes and three, three, three ears, whatever. And it became a spectacle. It became not something that was within a family unit, not something that was, you know, uh, close to the divine, not something that was just part of humanity. Instead, it became something other. It became the idea that we are empire and we are empire because you are what we colonized in a biological term. And this continued for quite a while. You know, this is the idea. It associated disability and impairment and emotional distress with otherness. And otherness can be dealt with in two ways. This, which is spectacle, ridicule, and prejudice, or it can be dealt with with a far more civilized, and I use that in an inverted commas way. And the civilized way is charity. But we'll go on to that in a second. Here's the, another image I just wanted to show you of, of women here working at Loom. So you can see for a uniform, all these women look quite similar. Um, they're all on a machine, it's all standardized. Your hands have to fit there, your legs have to fit there. There was children working there. But we're not seeing any, any well, not visual, visually, different people here. It's very similar, it's very ordered, but it's about production, it's about capital, and it's about your values associated to how much you can earn, how much you can produce. If you can't produce that, if you can't earn that within these parameters, it's narrow. And here we have a guy over in the corner who looks like Stalin, but it's not Stalin overseeing them. So now we come to the contemporary. Everyone's delighted to hear it. Now I use the contemporary as a quite large, space of time, going from about 1920 up to the present moment for 100 years. The contemporary, the contemporary period is interesting in Europe, and I use North America too, in that disabled people won against, once again, used for something else. The power structures were using representation for another thing. And previously, as we've seen, disability was used in different formats. It was understood in different formats. We go back to the Neolithic and Stone Age, disability wasn't used that we know of as much, but there was disabled people in those societies. In the classical period, disability, disability was seen and the physical difference was seen as outside that of the divine. The divine was achievable. The Middle Ages, disability was again seen in a different format on the whole. It was seen as something that was just part of life, perhaps even just a little bit better than average body because you were suffering for the next world. In the Enlightenment, it was outside the, the, the way of reason. We couldn't understand it. So therefore, it was locked away, hidden away. With the Industrial Revolution, it was a spectacle. It was like, look at this. These, these have no way in our society. You're not like them. You're, 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 you're different. You're, you know, you're at a higher level. Get back to your loo, make us more money. You know, these people will just cost money. That's the start of eugenics too. But in the contemporary period, something else happened. The contemporary period for me starts after the Wall Street crash. It starts after the Second World War really kicking. And it's where disability is associated with charity, not with a beggar with a bowl outside a, a, a church. Actually, one of the first films ever made was um, in 1894, and it was called The Fake Beggar. Um, and it just, it was, I think it's only 30 seconds long. It shows a, a, a man who's lying on the ground, he's sitting on the ground. He's got his legs underneath them, which it looks like they're gone. He's missing a limb. Uh, a chap comes out of a church, puts I don't know, some coins into his bowl and walks off. Then the beggar guy's legs come out from underneath them. He gets up, throws the crutch away and walks off. It's called the fake beggar is a comedy. So disability is associated with comedy. But it's also this kind of conscience as well. Well, of course, we have to look after these people because they're not capable of looking after themselves. So it comes in the idea of charity, not just medicine, but charity. And this is where the contemporary comes because now disability images have been copped on. People have realized, well, if there's charity, then there's money. Let's make a book. But to make a book, to make a euro, you have to have something to sell. And what's better to sell than sympathy? What's better to sell 
than charity. What's better to sell than images which break our hearts? Here we have a wee girl with leg splints. This is from the 1950s. It's called the March of Dimes. This was a, a charity that looked after disabled children and tried to eradicate um, polio in the 1920s, 30s, 40s in the States. Um, it's still going, by the way, one of these big telephones. They make millions every year and it goes to all these, you know, quote unquote special needs places. Here's another ugly picture that I like. This is another, say, 20 years later from the 70s. Uh, we can see it there. It's black and white. There's a young lad in a wheelchair, one of those big old, how horrible iron wheelchairs with, with uh, chrome on it. And it says, he'd love, a he'd love to walk away from this poster too. Muscular dystrophy. There we go. So he'd love to wake, walk away from this poster too. So you see this, this young lad staring back. Um, did he feel that way? Did he really want to walk away from this poster? Is this hideous to look at? So it's this idea of, well, well, did this lad make this poster himself and print it out and get it put up on the pictures on, on boards? No, he didn't. Who's controlling this image? This is the Muscular Research Society in England at the time. But it starts again, that disabled people's imagery is used for something else that the power of disability imagery is used for something else. And now it's used for financial gain. Now, not financial gain, but finances. It's used to evoke fundraising. Um, it become an industry, but not an industry controlled by disabled people, an industry that's run for disabled people by non-disabled people. And as a quite lucrative industry in Western Europe. I wanna show these pictures towards LinkedIn. I'm gonna end here. These are interesting pictures. These are the images that are bombarded a lot of the time that are, you know, young disabled people and other disabled people through our society. But they're all trying to sell something. They're all trying to fundraise. They're all trying to get money for these large industries, these large disability sector things. These, these things have rediscovered the power of disability imagery and how to use it for their own purpose. I, I, I don't think that the people in these photos knew that these images were going to be used like this um, and it's very very difficult to have power over that image if i know in a previous talk with, with fiona we've had catherine gallagher come in and talk about that and she talked about how the media uses imagery well this is how imagery is used by disability sectors and that's the new powerhouse using disability image we have we have little angels here i i again you know we're going back to the middle ages disability is is akin to god you know we're childlike we have raising money for a bus. We have raising money for whatever. I don't raise money as a consumer. I don't raise money for you know my local Tesco or uh, Aldi, or I don't go and say, geez, you know what government, give the ESB more money because they provide me with the service. So we have to understand these images as another series of power structures, of a power struggle that goes back millennia. But, and this is the important thing to remember with these images, and I'm just going to stop the presentation there and talk directly to the screen. But this is the important thing about these images, is that these images change. These power structures change. We've learned that from history, that not all the time it stays the same, that the struggle we're in now is not necessarily the struggle we'll be in in 10 years. So that it's not all negative, that it's positive. And that that little bit of resistance that's where we win these, these encounters and that's where we take back control. And by offering that resistance to the, the, the power structures that has happened in the past throughout millennia, well, then that's when things change that we take control over this. So thank you very much for listening to, to my rambling for the last few minutes. Um, I hope you, you, you enjoyed uh, listening to about disability imagery. I, I, if, if you wanna find out more about it, I'd recommend definitely checking out the work of Rosemary Garland Thompson. She's a critical disability scholar um, from the US and, and the work of um, Leonard Davis. Thank you.